Morning all. I'd like to show you this morning the Dutch Evergreen game. This was played by a player named Chris de Ronde. It was played in the Amsterdam Dutch Championship preliminaries of 1938. Chris de Ronde was a player who later played for the Netherlands in the 8th Chess Olympiad in Buenos Aires 1939. He was one of the champions of Rotterdam, uh, where, which, where he lived uh, originally when he was in the Netherlands. So this game in 1938 kicked off with c4. His opponent, Hendrik Hermes Kamstra, played knight f6, and actually we saw uh, a king's engine defense. Black played g6 now, and after e4, we see d6, d4, bishop g7, and here the Simish variation, f3. Black plays now knight bd7, bishop e3, e5, and now white plays d5. Now, black's uh, plans here are often for example, playing for f5 later and trying to keep the tension and trying to play on the queen side sometimes. But here we see black playing with quite a fixed pawn structure. We see a5, just trying to secure the knight on c5, really. Queen d2 and now b6. The problem with this is it's a very fixed uh, structure here. And now white even clamps down on the king side, so taking away black's f5 uh, plans altogether. If black had played, by the way, knight h5 earlier, then there might even be a pawn sack on f4 just to liberate the bishop in some instances. But here, okay, uh, black's pawn breaks have been absolutely minimized. It's quite a locked down uh, structure. Very, very closed position. So we have this position now where black plays h5 and it gets even more closed. g5, knight fd7, queen c2. Okay, so not much going on at the moment and maneuvering can be played without too much punishment. Time isn't a major issue. That's one of the beauties of these kind of closed positions. You can do a lot more maneuvering. So castling queenside, knight b a6, a3, stopping that knight b4, bishop d7. Black is interested in establishing a4 to get this b3 square and immobilize white's pawns here. King b1, castles, knight c1, and there's a challenge potentially to challenge this knight on c5 with knight d3 coming up, potentially. Some more maneuvering. Okay, queen d8. So the queen's interested in doing something on the queen side. h3. Interesting taking away the h3 square from the bishop, just in case. Queen c8. Attacking h3. Okay, that's protected. Rook e7. So again, it's a very close position, not much going on. So the first uh, 30 moves, in fact, uh, carry on like this. Okay, not too much going on. Bishop d3. Now black actually takes on d3 here. And he's interested in this knight c5 again. Doesn't mind, I think, if taking, maybe he'd consider taking this to open up that b file. We see a4 from white, taking away a4 from black. Okay, but there's a bit of a hole now on b4 as well, potentially. Queen c2. Eight, knight f2, again, uneventful. And actually, if you read um, the Tim Crabb link, which I'll give in the description of the video, uh, he kind of does a uh, uh, an allegory uh, kind of representation, as though the first 30 moves weren't that exciting. And um, what was like uh, Chris's life after 1939, uh, where he mysteriously disappeared after the... Um, Buenos Aires Olympiad, was it really, really exciting or something? So the first 30 moves so far haven't been the most amazing, most exciting. Uh, but hang in there, hang in there. So knight b5, okay, now taking, you know, we get this this c file, we get a bind on c6, so that's, that wouldn't be good to take. Okay, more maneuvering, so uneventful. So bishop e3 now, quite exciting here, offering the a4 pawn. So what's happened here? Why did white offer this a4 pawn? Well, white now plays, and this is where you need to wake up after move 30. Okay, wake up time, wake up. <laughs> 
So move 31. And this is why, actually, when it's remembered as the Dutch Evergreen, uh, these 30 moves weren't even shown as they, they were just completely lost. And the name of the opponent wasn't wasn't known. So it was just Chris de Rond, no name. And it started from here, from move 31. Which is a bit of a shame, you know, if, if you want the complete record of the game, then it's a, a complete mystery is made out of this game. You know, what were the first 30 moves? So, okay, it might be boring, but it's kind of nice to know for this continuation now. So I hope you've woken up now. White now plays. Guess what white plays in this position if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, white plays knight g4. So he wants to like get this h file going against the king. The queen's over here, stuck over here. If Kasparov looked to the position with that queen over there, he'd be thinking, how do we, you know, get to the king here? We've got an uh, advantage in, in material attacking the king here. Attackers versus defenders. Now, if it's not taken, then maybe knight f6 starts to look a little bit dangerous. Okay, but black does take it. I mean, possibly it's best to, to ignore it anyway. And let's not put it under engine scrutiny. Let's just let's go with the game for a moment. HG, HG. So we've got this H file. And the question here is, uh, usually with the Fianchetto bishop, usually there's enough defensive resource uh, not to worry too much. The bishop handles key squares. And the king has also got, in theory, an escape plan uh, to get out of danger here. So what happens here, which which is difficult makes it to make things difficult for black queen h4 so nothing immediately on the horizon the bishop is covering that h8 square black even starts the evacuation plan with king f8 queen h7 holding on to the king stopping it going for, to e7 because g7 will be dropping off so that's the first issue okay so black puts the knight back on c5 if given time you know black's going to arrange an attack of, of himself you know maybe even c6 no that's too dangerous um, not c6, but um, given time, black's surely going to do something here with the extra material. But how to get to this king? Isn't white's tracks, uh, white's attack stopped dead in its tracks at the moment? It looks like quite a blocked position. Guess what white plays in this position if I give you 10 seconds starting from now? Okay, a resource which should have been snapped off, by the way, on the previous move, instead of this knight um, coming back. This resource, which seems entirely irrelevant to king safety, it is actually made to be relevant to this kind of defensive stuff over here, this bishop on g7 in particular. It would be ideal if white could eliminate this defensive bishop. So this next move, if I've given you enough clues there, if I give you another 10 seconds, can you find it? So white play here. Okay. Knight d4. And all of a sudden, this is now relevant to black's king safety. If the knight isn't taken here, then knight f5. And you can imagine after take takes, f6 is going to be a menace. These pawns will be connected. And there'll be a mating there around the black king. So this, this knight is taken. And now here, you've really got to wake up. What does white play in this position? What's the idea of this knight sacrifice? If I give you 10 seconds here. Okay, queen sacrifice, queen takes g7, check. So eliminating the defender, Do trying to dominate these dark squares. If white can dominate these dark squares, that will, uh, be a mating net potentially. King takes, bishop takes d4, and already, you know, it's really, really dangerous. If the king steps back, then it looks as though bishop f6 uh, is a mating net. Um, or even just if king f8 check and then king e7, it looks as though actually, without turning on the engine, that this is mate here. Just immediately, bishop f6 splat. So the rook has to be put in front here. Okay, and this this reminds me a bit of Nesmetinov's, one of Nesmetinov's immortals with a positional queen sacrifice. 
So we're going to try and blast this diagonal open. And this move f4, trying to blast the diagonal open. Black hasn't got the dark square bishop, so this, this dark square bishop could be running rampant if it can just tear through that diagonal. Black now plays knight takes e4, and we see f takes e5, getting really dangerous now again for black's king safety. Knight takes g5, e6 check, offering, uh, sorry, black's offering that bishop, of course, to try and relieve the pressure. f6. Now, interestingly, White doesn't take uh, the bishop. He plays actually rook f1. So he really wants to keep this. Maybe this pawn is quite useful as an attacking resource for a moment. So he wants to try and win this and break through with a mating attack. OK, so black defends with rook f8. And now, only now, white takes the bishop. And all of a sudden, there's a, a threat of d8 potentially on the cards. If this rook can be deflected away from d8, uh, so rook takes f6 or bishop takes f6 is is dangerous. Um, actually, what what is the actual top threat? I'll just switch on an engine here to just tell you the top threat concretely. The top threat is actually rook takes f6. So it's a very very dangerous position here. Uh, so black tries to defend against this pawn uh, advancing as well. But now, hammer blow is played anyway. So even without d8 now, apparently being extinguished uh, because of this last move, white still plays, I guess you can guess it here, rook takes f6. So what is going on here, you might ask? Well, it's celebrating the pin. After rook takes f6, we celebrate the pin here. Remarkably, I mean, this is this is quite beautiful because you might think, well, there's a defensive resource here. If we try and celebrate the pin now with rook f2, isn't there the defensive resource knight e4 or any you know knight h7? Well, okay. In the game, we actually see knight e4, which apparently, um, according to my uh, engine here, is actually the best move. Knight h7 is not so hot as knight e4. Um, so, but let's go with knight e4. And in the game we see rook takes f6. Okay, and what's the point? The point is revealed now. The point is that if black dares to take on f6, we have g5, which will help this pawn promote. Let's have a quick look at this. Knight takes f6, g5. And how does black actually stop winning this uh, knight and then queening the pawn here? You know, for example, there's no defense here. This bishop's enough to to this. This will be a winning um, ending. A bishop up, in fact. That's going to lose that uh, be, a, be a bishop down after queening here. So this is spelling a disaster for black. Uh, this position after g5. So we see, sorry, rook takes f6, queen d8 is played. Instead of taking that rook, queen d8. And now, okay, white plays g5 here. Queen d8 is actually one of the best moves. Given that knight takes f6, uh, loses. Queen d8 is actually one of the best moves. Another move might be king h6, but queen d8 is one of the finest moves black can play here. Okay. Uh, so we see that g5. And now black plays uh, a move which isn't that brilliant. Black maybe uh, gets a bit greedy here, playing knight takes g5. And actually, possibly, uh, this might not have been a losing position. According to the engine Houdini, uh, at depth 25 at least, knight d2 check might have offered black some salvation after king a2. Uh, knight takes c4. Rook takes d6 check, discovered check. King f7, bishop f6. 
queen f8 and this might be sufficient for a draw here. For example, rook c6, queen b4 and black could get a perpetual check. So perhaps there was a drawing opportunity uh, missed here but it requires very, very accurate knight after knight d2 check, very accurate play to follow that up with. Okay. Okay, so knight takes g5 is played and we see rook takes d6 check. Discovered check. The king moves and now we see bishop f6. So the rook sacrifice just leading to this bishop and knight ending. C takes, bishop takes d8, still attacking the knight. Knight f7, and now the final move, bishop f6. And white is clearly now winning. He's going to be queening that pawn. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.